Welcome to Into the Storm Leaders, the no BS podcast that ignites leadership potential and sparks innovation in the ever-evolving business landscape we all work in. I'm Joe Jurek, your host and catalyst for growth, joined by my co-host and Culture Shock senior coach, Pete Hansberger. Together, we embark on a journey to uncover the strategies, mindsets, and actions that drive truly exceptional leadership and winning culture. Whether you're an emerging leader looking to level up in your career or an accomplished executive seeking fresh perspectives. Join us as we uncover inspiring stories and thought-provoking insights from proven leaders and share practical takeaways that enable courageous leadership. Get ready to charge into the storm and become a catalyst for better workplace culture. Welcome back listeners. It's another episode of Into the Storm Leaders. Today we're joined by a friend of mine. This is Kevin McDougall. He is a Vistage Chair in the Cleveland, Ohio area. And we have, well, I'm friends and have known Kevin's wife for 20 years or so. And we met a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Uh, And there are some parallels in our lives and the work we do. I'm just fascinated by Kevin and have been since I met him. He's got an awesome story, um, lots of great wisdom to share. And I was pumped to invite him to our offices in Westlake and sit him down for an interview with us today. So Kevin, I want to say hi. Yeah, I appreciate the uh, opportunity here, Joe. I, as you had mentioned, you know, you have a long relationship with my wife. Going back to Dairy Queen, there's a lot with that. But uh, when I met you, it was just interesting in our conversations in regards to what you do and how it just overlays what I do as well. So I'm looking forward to having a conversation about what we both do and, you know, how some of our experiences, you know, we can talk about in regards to similarities and some differences of what we've experienced through our careers. For sure. Well, you you've had a pretty remarkable career with lots of steps along the way. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that uh, a little bit and you can share, you know, what you're happy to, but the reason to your point that I thought this would be such a beneficial episode for listeners, well, they're emerging leaders, those that are um, in middle manager roles or have aspirations to become uh, a leader. And some of them are executives at entrepreneurial minded companies. And since we're talking about what works, what doesn't our own failures and wins. Maybe you can learn from some of that. And this guy across from me has more than many of the people that I know, uh, especially on the positive side. So I'd love, can you give me the high level if we start zoom backwards, kind of how you got to where you are now? Sure. So uh, I grew up on the west side of Cleveland. Uh, I attended Rocky River High School. I attended uh, John Carroll University. I got my degree from there. I went on and got my master's degree keeping that pretty brief, but, uh, I've always been one that has aspired to learning. I think that's very important for any, any individual that I work with, talk with, meet with is to really get where their passion is for learning. Sure. I think that's absolutely critical, but, uh, graduated from John Carroll in the eighties. I, uh, was a part of a company. I was looking at moving to Houston with Shell Oil, got a chemical background, chemical engineering background in business. And, uh, Fortunately, I found a company close here in, in um, actually Independence uh, by the name of Aga Gas. It was a Swedish company. Started with that company. They were uh, a manufacturer of industrial specialty and medical gases. Mm-hmm. Started in that organization, a management trainee. So I grew up in a business that I rolled cylinders, filled cylinders, sold welding equipment, run, ran a truck for a while, got into materials management. The company did it outstanding job of training. They'd move me around about every three months into different departments within the organization to really get a really good view of how the organization worked, which I'm a big fan of. And I think from my experience with a lot of companies, you know, we've got to do a better job overall of training our people, getting them and from a succession planning standpoint, bring those individuals up and how companies do it. There's a wide variety of ways to do it, but the way I was taught and went through, I thought was outstanding. So I was with Aga Gas for about, I'm going to say 12 years in 2000, no, it was actually 1999, Aga Gas was acquired by Lindy. Okay. Um, I worked for Lindy for a couple of years and I was approached by Air Gas. And Aga Gas was when you talk about into the storm, you know, when I, when about early in my career, about a year and a half after being trained, they asked me to move to Detroit, Michigan. and and you talk about an experience in a, in a storm 
first of all, when you get asked to move your family to away from your family, where everybody is, you go to an area you don't know, like Detroit. And back then I could tell you stories, but uh, I love Detroit. Don't get me wrong. The Red Wings were great. You know, <laughs> a lot of, I mean, we had the Fab Five with Michigan. You had the Pistons were three-peating, you know, all kinds of good stuff. But it's not on the top 10 list for many as far as destinations to move to in the U.S., but hey. No, it's not. But I'll tell you what, I loved it up there. But the, the challenge was at the time, my wife was pregnant at the time um, with our first child. And she stayed back in Ohio. I, I went up there for about six months prior to looking for a house, et cetera, working up in that, in that market space. I was approached to take that position because we had an acquisition of Lindy of the Great Lakes. It was Aga Gas I worked for, but we, it was a smaller company up there, about four or five branches. Yeah. And uh, I learned a lot with that, with that move. When I got up there, the acquisition had already occurred. They wanted me to really come in, help sales, operations, et cetera. And they had already told the drivers, they had gotten rid of a few people already that were key individuals within the organization. So they didn't do their due diligence in regards to understanding the business first. Okay. So they eliminated a, a position, a repair gentleman that was there that really knew all the customers, had all the relationships, didn't realize that. They told drivers that look, you have jobs for about two more weeks. We're going to consolidate with one of our bigger COCs, central distribution operation centers. And um, so the drivers were out sabotaging accounts. Somebody, could you imagine a, an account that uses nitrogen to freeze the things and they get a liquid argon instead? That was the kind of stuff that I ran into when I, when I took this position. Yikes. So I learned a lot about acquisitions at the time through that of how to handle them, what to do and what not to do. And how critical it is for culture match as well through acquisitions uh, and how you really work with the people to keep every, everybody engaged and make sure that there's a smooth transition with customers, et cetera. So I uh, bought a house up there. That was my first move. I was there for about four years. We did very well. We grew the business. I created a lot of really good relationships. Um, I got to see a lot of Red Wings games. And back then we did a lot of entertaining from sports side and and I was, I was up there at a great time where the Fab Five were there. You know, the, the Pistons were very strong and three-peated and that was a great time. Uh, but it was very, very difficult in regards to my wife at the time, uh, since been divorced, but she, she stayed in Ohio. I was up there for basically about four years by myself. So it was a struggle in regards to family, but continued to have in that four years, we had three children. And um, I think, you know, the biggest thing that I learned was life work balance is so critical and i think a lot of a lot of us that um, are my age i'm 57 years old um back at that time we were workaholics that's continued throughout my life mm. and i work a lot and i preach and will coach to making sure that that work-life balance is is more intact and i think you're seeing more of that with the younger generation now where individuals want to, it's not all about the money or anything else. They want the flexibility, et cetera. Sure. So, but back at that time, uh, things went very well business-wise. We were the business. That was really my first storm that I really came into with an acquisition that really wasn't really coordinated very well. A lot of issues with people, et cetera. And as a young person at the time, you know, two years out of college, it was really a great learning experience for me. Boy. Then uh, got moved down back to Ohio, you know, after four years, I uh, wanted to be close to family. And I can't say enough about, you know, how many people I work with that have relocated and talked about moving and the heartaches where you move away from family. And I don't meet a lot of people that, you know, it's sustainable. Uh, they want to get back to family. So uh, I had approached some people within the company and said, I'd like to move back. They were working toward that. I got kind of close. I, I moved down to the Ashland, Ohio area in Mansfield, handled that area for a little while. And um, we're there, was there for about four years. That was more of a, a gentleman was retiring that was running that operation down there. I stepped in, you know, back then there were no emergencies to go from Detroit where there were emergencies all the time, you know, back then we didn't have cell phones either. So that's another, you know, and I, back in the late nineties, early, or late eighties, early nineties, there were no cell phones. You had to go to pay phones. Yeah. And uh, a different world. 
a whole different world. And it was kind of interesting. So back then I had what was called warehouses. So we had set up too with this acquisition. We had other like distributors that we would manufacture gas, take the cylinders down and they would sell it. Well, these particular warehouses back then did cash sales. So I would have to go in these not really great neighborhoods in Detroit, Michigan, and go in and pick up thousands of dollars in cash in an envelope. All right. So not, not real uh, fun at the time, you know, I'm naive and, you know, young guy now, mm. I would have said, no, this is not the right way to do this, et cetera. But I would, I'd go p find a payphone, call the distributor and say, I'm going to be there in about five minutes, have everything ready and literally walk in, grab it and walk out. Wow. So, so um, and no knock on Detroit. I love Detroit. So many things, but just, you know, the, the things back then were a little bit different. You know, they had hell's night. Um, there were carjackings right down the street from my house. When, uh, when we bought a house, uh, people would come up to cars with a gun and just say, get out of the car. There were a lot of car jackings that way back then. So, um, and on top of all that, with having young kids, I remember my daughter, my oldest daughter, she's 33 now, I think 32. Uh, she had some real health issues. Unfortunately, we were close to a hospital up there and they've got a good hospital uh, situation. Uh, in the Detroit metropolitan area, but uh, we had some children issues too. When you have small kids, there's typically some issues there too. So trying to work through all that as a young person was very difficult. You know, just mindset again, it's, you know, I think with anybody, you know, staying focused on the key things you need to get done and time management and what's important and that life work balance is extremely important. Uh, I didn't make all the greatest decisions, <laughs> um, but Again, that learning process has put me where I am now. From yeah. now. So that was one piece of it. So got back to Ohio, moved to Ashland, was there for about three years. They asked me to come up back up to Cleveland and run that business. But that was probably in about 96, 97. Uh, that worked very, very well. I was really focused on some big accounts. LTV Steel was around back then. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of big customers. Over the next several years, I mean, uh, it was more growth mode really looking at, you know, trying to win business from our competitors. We did that in 1999, went through an acquisition. Lindy came in, bought the business. It was a different, you know, going from Swedish to German ownership. Okay. Um, Germans came in quite a bit. Um, just a different culture. Um, training was still there, um, but it was more, you know, more ROIs, which is return on investments, more capital. Yeah. You know, bureaucracy, things of that sort. So in 2003, I was a pro, and we dealt with Y2K also. I mean, Y2K for a lot of companies, we went through an SAP transition. Okay. Um, so that was a great experience as well to go through and see how you integrate and how the process is to really change platforms is it's a huge deal. It's and a I, massive undertaking that affects every corner of the organization, right? I don't think people realize that no doubt before they it. get into it. No doubt. And you have to have a good plan. And, and it was critical. And, you know, through the training, the sandbox, uh, everything, there's, there's a lot to a, a change in platform. And I'll get to when I became uh, um, a CEO in private equity. And that was a big thing also is when you come into an organization, build that structure out, the platform is critical. So... So we changed, we went to SAP. So that was a great, great time. It wasn't really a time of, I would say a storm. It was more just a time where there was transition. There was a lot of people that were insecure about it, training, you know, issues with the, with the uh, software that, you know, I think LTV went down because of SAP and Nestle. There were a few companies that, you know, through the transition didn't have a good integration and really cost them their business. Mm. But, um, so went through that. No, I was the, the vice president of Lindy at the time had transitioned to air gas and air gas is a competitor of Lindy, same field manufacturing of industrial specialty medical gases. You're saying you transitioned personally to the vice gas, president, right? the vice president of Aga Lindy gas mm -hmm. was Aga gas, uh, part of Lindy, but, uh, he had moved over and I knew him pretty well. So in 2003, he had called me. This was, I think he had transitioned about 99 or, or 2000, called me and asked me to sit down and talk about maybe a transfer of, of going from Lindy to Airgas. Okay. And I think that's, 
that's the other, you know, when I look at storms over the years, when you're in a position where you've been with a company for so long, you have all your friends. And at the time in Great Lakes, there might've been, maybe we were doing $1.5 million total in this area. Mm -hmm. And Lindy was maybe about 400 million. So a lot of infrastructure, everything else. And, uh, um, I walked in a situation, I agreed to come over. My wife didn't at the time, didn't support me in that. And, um, uh, but she trusted me. And, uh, so I made the transition and I remember, you know, when I went over, we had a little office space, uh, we were looking at Oakwood, but we had no branches in the area. Um, so there was a lot of, um, I would say in my mind, it was, I'll put it this way. In my mind, you know, I started questioning, was this the right decision? Yeah. Um, there was maybe four of us in the office. There was a president there. There was basically myself and another person that basically, how do we kick this business off? How do we start, you know, scratch start starting branches, et cetera. From my experience with, with prior companies, you know, propane was a big big, uh, business. But at that point, the biggest, the biggest storm that I hit there was transitioning from company with structure, you know, bigger organization to one that was smaller. There wasn't a lot of infrastructure need to build it out, right? You know, go out, search for new sites, start ac acquiring businesses, looking at that, spending time with that. Was that part of the appeal uh, that it would it give was. you the chance to kind of cut your teeth on that? Now that you've been part of a larger organization like that? I'm always curious because sure, a lot of risk comes with that and it's, sure. you know, kind of uncharted territory in a sense, but I'm always curious if people felt like they were more running to something or, or almost running from, if, if you'd pass the expiration date with, uh, with Lindy and through the different transitions of ownership and some people leaving, if you felt like, all right, now it's just time to get out. Or if it was, mm -hmm. I need to go and do this myself and figure it out. I think really Joe is probably a combination of both. Yeah. I think at the time it was, I didn't see a clear path where I was going. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, I felt real comfortable with some of the senior leaders within the organization. Sure. Um, so I felt very good. And I think a lot of us have the, the individual left and went there. Yes, it was recruiting me really was, as I looked at it, was a real mentor toward me. Mm -hmm. It would really take me under his wing and help me. So that really played into it. And I felt there was a much better path. And I felt like somebody would help me along and really help coach in regards to what I really needed to know to get to those next levels. And I think that played a lot into it. Isn't it crazy how the relationship, the trust level with one human can play such a huge factor when you know, there's that mutual respect, that belief, that mentorship. It's like, I'd, I'd go to war, I'd, I'd fight for you, but I'd also, you know, put some trust in a major life move like that. No doubt about it. And I can speak for myself. I, I see it with others as well, but you know, that culture that we talked about and having somebody that really has your back, you know, is so critical. And, um, unfortunately I had that and I did, I think back to your question, you know, for me, it was a big risk, but with any risk, you know, a lot of times that risk, it can pay off really big rewards. For sure. So, and I've always been a risk taker and I encourage a lot of people out there to take risks. I mean, you've got to evaluate, you know, what are the, the downsides as well, but I think overall, you know, for me in the long run, when I look at it now, it was a great move. You know, at the time I really started thinking, oh man, what am I, what did I do? We're going to do this. But I think mindset is so critical in so many things. And my mindset was really just go out and execute. And, you know, it's, it's like we talk a lot in, in uh, businesses, really stay out of the weeds, stay focused on, I call them critical few rocks, mm -hmm. you know, EOS calls them rocks. I back before even EOS, you know, I was big on critical few. And so I did a really good job in my career of outlining what are the, the really critical few things that I need to do and get done. And I'm sure we're probably going to talk about time management and stuff here, but, but really organize and, and time manage what I do, where I do it and make sure that I delegate really well so that I'm not getting pulled in the weeds and I can get things accomplished. So a lot of it was scratch starts. A lot of it was acquisition work, focused on big customers, et cetera. And it worked very, very well. So. You know, that, that time period of making that transition was working into a storm because again, I, again, to leave all my friends and everything, I'm competing directly against a lot of my friends. Um, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. I'll put it that way, but I did have a lot of confidence in my mentor and that's really to your point, 
you know, re really moved me. So I think that's critical in any young person's, you know, career is find a good mentor that's smarter and, and will take you under the wings and spend time with you. Yeah. That is absolutely critical. So that was another kind of storm that I, I had to deal with in, in regards to my career and a big decision because who knows what would have happened if I would have, well, I know what would have happened and we can get to that in a minute. But so then in 2007, I was with Air Gas and we went back and we bought Lindy. All right. <laughs> so we, we transitioned over. So all the friends and all the people I work with all of a sudden came over. So I look like a genius because all of a sudden people there are now working for me. Yeah. So I had the in route. So it was interesting. We bought the bulk business in 2007 and then negotiated a deal for the package gas business to come along with it about six months later. Sure. So, um, at that time, you know, I look back and in retrospect, it was like, I really did make a big decision that turned out really well for me, but you know, what did I give up in those years? So, you know, there's, there's different things, but I think overall it worked really, really well. I learned a lot about acquisitions and just really starting with a smaller company and, and moving up. Yeah. So then 2007, we acquired Lindy and then we had the big one, which is probably the biggest, you know, storm that came to me was in 2008. So I had air gas. My mentor, the divisional president for air gas, come to me and wanted me to run basically, you know, from Buffalo over to the coast. And um, it was a big business. It was our east region and approached me. And I think it was probably August of 2008. As I think most of us recall, if you've been there, October 2008 was the big recession that hit. And You're most not the manufacturing businesses dropped by about 30% over. You're not the first one to mention that time frame as a storm. But uh, they have sure. pretty clear memories of some of the pains that came with it. Yeah. And so for me, a month prior, I got moved to a different region without knowing what was going to happen. And uh, so I said, sure, I'll do this. And uh, so I was going to move up to the East Coast somewhere, run this business. And I was putting my house up for sale. And I get up there and within a month, the recession hit and nobody's buying houses, my house. Wouldn't. So basically I was, I was up there for about three years. I was there until about, I want to say 2011. Okay. My family at the time was still staying in Ohio. So I was going back and forth, traveling back and forth. Sometimes I'd stay up there. I was living at hotels, trying to work with the organization. They paid all my expenses, housing, things like that. But basically I had such a big area. I just lived at hotels all week. Just either I started over in Albany or you know, there and moved all over Buffalo. But, um, but that was a true storm in regards to your face with taking on a, people don't know you, employees didn't know me. Mm -hmm. The recession hit. So obviously companies are looking at expenses. Do you do reduction in forces? Do you, you know, how do you determine who you keep, who you don't? And the storm was, you know, if you don't know the people and you don't know, how do you determine, you know, which people to keep, which one's not? you know, strategy in those cases is so critical. And the way I approached it was one of the things that I've learned over time that's a big takeaway for me during that time was when you hit some, some recession times, you hit downturns in the economy, et cetera, uh, I always looked at it as an opportunity. And, and what I mean by that is keep your salespeople. You know, I know it's a hit on the P&L, you mm -hmm. know, look at other costs, et cetera. But keep your sales force intact, go out and look at it as an opportunity where I had a lot of my competitors were doing reduction in forces, et cetera. They cut their sales staff big time. Yeah, We were able to go out, go after those customers that weren't seeing and knew they lost their, their good people. If there were, I was, I was hiring competitive, you know, people, if they were good people that I knew that somebody said, yeah, we need to go after this person. So it was a time that I looked at is we know we're going to come out of it eventually. Let's build the infrastructure, but get a, get rid of individuals that maybe C players and yeah. below where, you know, let's really do an analysis and do the severance. So I did a reduction in force, but I really focused on keeping salespeople, the good salespeople mm -hmm. uh, going after new accounts and really had them focus and started implementing what I call war rooms. And the war rooms were really focused on going after new business and really tracking new business. You know, a lot of, uh, I'll get into the weeds a little bit here, but Salesforce CRM was, you know, that was around, I'm not a, I'm not a super big proponent of CRM where reps and people are documenting a lot of stuff every night. And, uh, but I am a real proponent of utilizing the tool 
that really helps the organization grow business. So what yeah. I mandated was any business, any new accounts, whatever that you were going after, I wanted those documented where maybe it was 10 targets. And every month we'd circle back and we would talk about where we at with each one of these that there was a criteria. It was, sure. okay, if, if you have 10 accounts, it needed to be accounts that were closed within 30, 60 days, you know, meet this criteria, $50,000 a year. There's criteria out there. So all I wanted to do is really track and talk to the reps and make them accountable to, you know, have target accounts. Well, you tend to take in some of that critical few mentality and then applying it to your sales force, right? Helping them understand yes. prioritization. Yeah, throughout. So exactly. And again, I think having focus on critical few is, you know, laser focus. We talk about businesses that, you know, have decisions and should I get in this product line and this product line, but focus is absolutely critical. So you, in every facet of the business. Do you have a process for that or, or are there just off the cuff things that come to mind when you're trying to simplify, prioritize, cut through all of the fog to say, nope, these are the few things that are most critical. Like wh what is your, the process what do you look at? Determining yeah. it? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I'll go back to, I think, one-to-ones with people, your, your executive staff, for me, my vice presidents, having one-to-ones on a regular basis yeah, and really talking about what are the biggest things. And I'm a big proponent of getting individuals even below the executive staff involved in it. So when you pull in some of your workers on the floor and you pull in, you know, different departments and you throw out some critical questions, you know, what is affecting our customer service? What is affecting our quality? How do we grow our sales? You know, these critical questions, and I've got a set of questions that I utilize and you bring in a team and you throw these out and you get everybody's responses. And then you look at these responses and what you'll find a lot of times is you'll have a lot of crossover from people in different departments to say, hey, here's a real issue. Sure. And all of a sudden it hits you in the face and it's like, that's gotta be a critical few. You know, when you work through a strategic plan, one of the things I learned a long time ago was you know, you'll have like EOS where either you go five, three years out mm -hmm. from strategic plan. You know, the critical thing is, okay, you have these big strategic initiatives that you have, but one of the things a lot of companies don't, they see that, but you might have a smaller initiative that isn't going to be a, a huge cost saving or something, but you can do it within 15 days and mm -hmm. execute. So there is a, a process by which you need to really evaluate which ones are most critical? It's not always the biggest one. Right. Which ones can you do fast? How much manpower, et cetera, will it take to, you know, work through it? So really putting those on paper and really having your team and a team of people within your organization say, hey, here's what I think we should look at. And then bring the team back in and say, these are ones we're going to, you know, work on. Sure. Then you have buy-in from the people because it, it came from them, right? So I'm a big proponent of that. I think getting people involved in employee engagement. Right now, I think a lot of companies are struggling with inventory and they struggle with employee retention. Those are two biggest things I hear, you know, all the time from companies. And we're getting into some of the things I want to talk about most. You've touched on them throughout your entire yep. freaking story so far, but yep. uh, it, you're 100% right. Yeah. It's... And we'll get more in the weeds on that. But I think, you know, that, that 2008 storm was one where, you know, I was up, I was, you know, spending a night with dinner meetings all the time because my family was back in Ohio. I'd get mm -hmm. back as much as I could. And. Anybody that's ever traveled from Buffalo to Cleveland in the winter and had a whiteout knows what I'm talking about. It is a scary thing. It wasn't fun. It was a very trying time. I had more kids. I had triplets at the time. Whew. Born, they were premature. You know, but again, you go into these things and you've got a financial crisis. You have you have to execute on people. One one story I'm not real proud of is um, I am a big believer, and I'm sure we're going to get in the weeds, but. Um, I, I'm a believer that you have to move on people very quickly. I've always been, you know, companies, businesses, it's, people are number one. Yeah. And when I went up there, I always had throughout my career, the biggest thing for me was execute on, if you don't have somebody in the right seat, that's the most important thing and you move on it. Yeah. So for a while, my nickname corporately at Airgas was Hacksaw. And because I cut a lot of, when I went up there, I cut about 33% of the, pe the people because they just weren't at the level that I figured need be. So for me, I'm sure we'll get into it, but it's always people and strategy at the top. Have a good strategy, good people, but then a structure and then efficiencies. And those work in, in relationship to each other, but at the top is always execute on people. If they're right people, great. Get those people, get the A players. If not, move on very quickly. Mm. Don't hesitate. And I see that a lot.
So up there, I cut a lot of people. I went around to my direct reports. Who do you have? Who's your C players, et cetera. I looked at the structure very cohesively and said, look, this is how I think we can change some things from customer service. We had different ways of consolidating some people and some of the shared services and um, executed on that. So, you know, coming in, I wasn't the favorite person because I was cutting heads. I was moving some people from certain positions where, you know, another whole dilemma is how do you determine when you have somebody in the wrong seat? Do you move them to a def different position or do you let them go? Or how do you, you know, I'm a big proponent of performance improvement plans as well. And we can get into that. And I see a lot of, a lot of companies that don't use, I feel, performance improvement plans, first of all. And secondly, they don't use them in the right way. Uh. Performance improvement plans should be, really be utilized to really help people along to help them improve, hold your manager accountable to work with the individual, sure. you know, have a plan. And, and really, so many times I see companies utilize a PIP at the last thing, well, we're going to do a 30-day PIP. You're not doing on this in a way to exit with documentation. Because typically companies don't have good documentation. It's a either. formality, a, a step on the way out the door, right? Instead yeah. of it being used constructively, yeah. productively. Yeah. And that may be the last time that they talk to a manager or the first time since their annual performance review that was half-assed well, you know, a year before. That's exactly right. And that's why I'm a big proponent of one-to-ones too. Yeah. Performance reviews, I'm not a big proponent of. I'm, I'm more a proponent of doing one-to-ones every week and talk to them. And that, I think that'll help employee yeah. retention as well. So. You know, 2008 was really a, a big thing as well. And, you know, you talk about storms. So, you know, early in my career, it was a storm going to Detroit. And then I had the storm when I went to air gas. And then 2008 was another storm. You find that I could go on and on, but those were probably the biggest storms that I had to work through yeah. from a family. You know, whenever, whenever I go through issue processing or anything, you know, I always break it down by, I call it herd. And herd is H-E-R-D and it's hours, emotions, relationships, and dollars. So whenever I look at an issue, I look at those four components and really evaluate each one of those in, in an overall sense that says, how are each one of those, you know? So uh, it really allows me to really get to the, the crux of what are the biggest issues or biggest components of a decision and what you need to do. Through each one of those storms, I would highly recommend that, you know, the thing is you you figure out what the critical few things that really need to be done in that crisis. And it's all about execution. Yeah. Wow. That's great. I, I normally I, I'm, I'm pulling for, for different storms and things you laid out quite a bunch, right? Where it's just those difficult, uncomfortable, painful moments that hiding won't do any good. Turning away from it won't do any good. It's just going to become a bigger and bigger issue, right? Unless you do deal with it head on. And I think even the having to move on people real quickly, there's, there's a kindness element of that as well, instead of dragging somebody along, or if you, you know, somebody's not a fit, you know, that either they're miserable or they're not engaged. It's just, there might be the right person for the company to your point, or they're the wrong person in, in the wrong seat through your experience with that, uh, Kevin Hacksaw McDougal, <laughs> I know you said you weren't super happen. proud of that one, but look, it, it is. It's a weight that leaders carry. It's something that we're responsible for is having to make hard decisions and having to have hard conversations when inevitably there are some reductions from time to time. You can still do it in a compassionate way. I know you, so I know that you care about people. You are uh, thoughtful about what things are like for them. In your experience, I mean, it, are there any best practices for how you've rip the bandaid off, how you've communicated some of those tough conversations when it is an unfortunate storm, something you had to charge into and make a hard decision to eliminate roles or just uh, individual termination. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that comes to mind as far as a sure. strategic, compassionate way to go about it. You never, you're going to affect somebody's family, right? Um, I think the way I've always looked at it is I've got one person doing a role that's bringing the team down. And typically, how many times do you hear where somebody waited, waited, and then everybody else is like, hey, what took you so long? And you have to, in my mind, you have to look at how is it really affecting everybody else in the organization? Oh, so yeah. it's, a, it's more of a scale of you feel really bad about this individual. In my mind, you have to go through a PIP. So many times I find, so for me, if I've gone through the process and I've given an individual every opportunity, and that's, a, that's what I love about 
performance improvement plans as well is typically if somebody knows they're not performing, Joe, 50% of the time they leave on their own without you even having the term him. They find another job, they've got some time, they know it's coming. What's worse is when you get in a situation where, you know, I would have an employee, a manager, have an employee and, you know, I get a call and like, yeah, I got terminated, but I didn't even, it was like, I was blindsided. I didn't even know. They had no clue. And this happens. It's something that it happens, happens a more lot. than it should. It does happen a lot. And that's where the compassion. So to answer your question, to be compassionate is to provide the right process, which is a PIP to an individual, let them know and make sure that they understand expectations. A lot of people don't know expectations. That's why these one-to-ones I talk about are so critical. Hey, not doing this and, and having it up front and, and people respect that. People don't respect managers that don't really talk to them, but it happens a lot. Right. So that's got to come from the top. You institute that up at the top in, in the alignment, you know, we'll probably get in alignment as well, but the alignment within the organization of how you roll these things out and you're all on the same page is also critical. So to answer your question, very compassionate, but you have to look at what is best for the business. Do you have the right person? Give them every opportunity, but I'm not a big, big advocate of taking somebody that's struggling in one role and just moving them to another. But if it really makes sense, then, then I'm always open to it. But it's really finding, really, is this person better in a certain position and certain things that you can really give them the opportunity to succeed. But the worst thing you can do is I see on the other side too, is where people will promote individuals and set them up to fail because they really don't have the experience and not ready. So that can be another thing as well. And you know, it goes on both sides, but from a compassion standpoint, I think you work through the process, you do everything to help somebody. That's the best you can do. And you have yeah. to look at the overall, you know, how do other people feel about it? How's it putting stress on other people if they're not pulling their own weight? That's the way I look at it. I, I like one of the first things you mentioned about the considering the big picture of how this person is affecting others. We influence each other far more than anyone realizes positively, negatively. And if you have a toxic top performer, somebody who's not pulling their weight, somebody who's negative all the time, those who do really care, who are engaged, who are putting an effort and like, it gets away with it. It brings them down, right? If you string that person along, if you let those who are underperforming or not a culture fit, not a value fit, stick around and you don't move off of them, the rest of your workforce is kind of like, what the hell? You know, they get away with it. This, and I, I'm sure this is where there's some parallels. And I'm curious what else you see, but this issue alone is one of the most frequent that I see is people are promoted into managerial roles, didn't necessarily have background or training or even the, the right mentors, but through tenure, through institutional knowledge, they've been there the longest, they've been a top performer as an individual contributor, move into a manager role. So many middle managers then struggle with giving criticism, feedback. There's that almost fearful avoidance of the pre prior to performance improvement plan, like the, the one-on-one -on -one to say, Hey, you're not really doing this right. Or, uh, just to give any of that in the moment feedback. So people are blindsided. They're, they're caught off guard. It's the worst thing ever. So the other big thing that stood out to me is when you talked about doing a performance improvement plan, it was that word expectations. They're assumed, they're implied that we are clearly setting expectations with people. However, often the reason that it's so scary to terminate or have a performance conversation is because you realize I have to own some of this. I didn't clearly communicate those expectations or give them every chance to be successful. Once you do, it's a lot easier to have an accountability conversation or to just check in and be like, how do you feel you're doing, you know, based on that conversation we had, but boy, like th those things, properly setting expectations and then communicating clearly, compassionately and directly. So people know where they stand instead of it becoming this major issue down the road where it's like, now we've reached the point of no return. We got to move on from this person, but is it all there? Well, not, not always, not often, right? What have you seen uh, with all the different industries, middle managers you've now worked with, advancing leaders, emerging leaders? What are some of the, the biggest areas that they need to focus on or, or recurring gap areas? Like, do you agree with that 
ability to have the tough conversations and give criticism is one of the biggest. What, what do you think, or what, in your experience, what have you seen as some of the most challenging leadership areas for those who are still growing in their roles? So I'll comment on a couple of things that you talked about. Um, you know, back when I was growing up as a leader uh, and being trained, a lot of people got terminated or lost their jobs because of performance issues. I would say over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been more and more focus on behavioral. So more and more you're seeing individuals. And what I see, Joe, out there is I'll see somebody that, you know, one of the biggest struggles is a corporation has an individual performs at a very, very high level, but is a total jerk. Doesn't treat people well, mm. just... And I see corporations actually adjust things to more work around somebody that doesn't want to do this or just, you know, is a, is a, uh, an issue in meetings, et cetera. Just, so I just wanted to set that straight was, I think, um, dealing with those type of individuals is, as I'm seeing more and more of that, just a lot of negativity. And he talked about, I mean, one of the things that I alluded to earlier in this uh, discussion was the passion. I just had this conversation with an individual the other day and passion is so critical for me when, whenever I interview somebody, even though maybe they don't have everything, but that passion, somebody is passionate about something, they're going to learn. They're going to want to learn. So if they want it, if they want it, right, if that's... they want it, they're going to go after it. And I think that's a big thing. And, uh, you know, now you have all these profiles, culture index, you got all these different things that you mm -hmm. can utilize to, you can use them as tools. It's not a, a be all end all, but I think you utilize these tools to really give you a, a higher percentage chance to put the person in the right seat. Right. But to your point, I don't think, I think one-to-ones are great. I want to see them throughout organizations. They got to start at the top, the expectations, clear expectations, et cetera. But my main question that I would ask is, have the middle managers and the supervisors been really trained to, to actually execute on those, you know, yeah. and do them properly. You know, I think most of the companies that I see that do a really effective job is they'll have a form that's really universal throughout the organization that maybe, hey, it takes 15 minutes very clearly. You know, what are your critical view? What are important? Are there any issues? Highlights, low lights. You know, one of the things that we didn't get to was, so I retired from air gas. Uh, 2016, because Air Lee Key came in and bought the company as a French company. And uh, for me, again, we go back to fit. You know, it's, it's also fit within an organization when you acquire business, but it's also for an individual. Yeah. And the way I'm built, I'm, I'm very growth built where I want to grow business. I want to look externally, et cetera. Some companies, you know, in that particular uh, event where Air Gas was acquired, you know, we sold to Air Lee Key. Uh, yeah. Early key was more of a company. We need to lower our inventories. We need to cut commissions. You know, that's not the way I'm built. So I exited the company. And then at that point I got into, um, the private equity arena mm -hmm. and business for a while and did a lot of traveling and, uh, found that my life work balance was very, very bad. And, um, and I've struggled with that through my career. I think a lot of, you know, the way I'm built is having that balance is something I always have to come back to, but but I think going back to your question, I got off topic a little bit. That's right. The, you know, and then I got into Vistage and I've been working for seven years now, really coaching and helping individuals through emerging leaders, advancing. And what I see is those kind of programs are where companies are really, I think, need to improve. You need to make sure that your middle managers really understand how to conduct a one-to-one, -one, but also ensure that it's, it's also managed properly and they're being done. And, um, so, you know, again, that's just one of the flaws. I, th I think the one ones you have to somehow in your culture and culture is a whole different topic. Uh, culture is so critical. And we talk about it in our meetings and, and I see it in a lot of companies. We talk about it all the time. Culture is, is one of the biggest things from a retention standpoint, things you're doing, et cetera. But I think that that relationship between an individual and their boss, you know, as opposed to confrontational, et cetera, how do I help, et cetera, doing the one-on-ones to understand where they need help really is a big thing. So if companies can train their middle management to do better one-on-ones, how to conduct those, really get to the points and get them done 15 minutes, yeah. I think it's critical. Hopefully yeah. that answers your question. It does. I, I think that that's, you, throughout, you, you've talked about some of these things that you've identified need solved for. Uh, and then also just something as simple as that approach, having consistent free-flowing 
one-on-ones. People know where they stand. It should never be a surprise right, uh, of how you are perceived in the organization, how your performance is doing. Or, and that's something that we as leaders can, can give is consistency. Like when you talk about these systems, tools, it doesn't need to be treated as gospel. People can find something that's most relevant to them. What I love about it most, we're singing from the same sheet of music. We have a common language, a common set of tools where it's still encouraged to stay human, not to be robotic or scripted, mm -hmm. but we at least know there's a process. Like we always look at people, process, tools. Yep. All right, what are your people, process, tools? And I think similarly, you talked about your, your people and strategy and then, you know, structure uh, inside of it. So much overlap, so much. Uh, you know, what I loved about EOS, it wasn't that it was this new take on things that I'd never really thought of before. It was almost frustrating for me to see how elegantly packaged these simple things were that I inherently knew, but still struggled with sometimes in articulating them to others or getting everyone else on the same page aligned and rowing together. And the way that they were simple is like, yeah, this makes a little too much sense. I wish I had thought of this before. But even today, I think that's what we look to do is distill, curate, find these different things that will work for each person. But it all comes back to you know, having more open conversations. Yeah, I think to add to that, I think one of the important things in, in any corporation or organization's culture, uh, there's control and there's flexibility. And there's, there's how those work together is very important as well. And a lot of people don't, don't really look at how, how they can be, you know, companies go to a point where we got to institute this control and this control, and they become more control oriented than flexible. Um, it, it's a bigger discussion, but, but you want to maintain flexibility within an organization where you allow people to, you know, do things on their own. There's not, well, coming back and am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to do that? Et cetera. And right. there's a real balance there. And, and that's going over. We talked a little bit prior to this about the life cycle of organizations and uh, the lifespans, et cetera. And you get the different points in an organization of a lot of the bigger companies will get to a point where they become stagnant. And how do you really get that fire back in where it's not a, we'll call it a go-go organization where they're going out, they're acquiring, they're going after new business, et cetera, right? They grow and more controls and more structure. And then you get a point where, Oh my gosh, how, how can I get back to more flexible where people are making, you know, the, the, the decisions that need to be made on a fly as opposed to not having all these controls and right. things. And we see it over the lifespan of an organization and understanding that as I think is important as well. But, you know, again, it's, it's really hmm. train the people, you know, really, really be very intent on building a culture in certain ways. I'm a big fan of bringing employees and tiger teams and having like culture. I mean, put a team together through a diverse, you know, group of individuals within the organization at different levels and say, your task is to meet every month and come up with good culture things that we can do, bowling things, sure. golf things, like whatever. a committee, a committee. With inside the organization. Yeah. yeah. Get people in, and when they're involved and they have skin in the game because they've, they've come up with some of these things, they're going to feel like they're more included in a lot of decisions that are being made. So I'm a big proponent of that as well. There's something about intentionally bringing people together from different functions. And that, that's what we do with our programs too, right? We believe that the most effective learning and change happens is when you have a cross-functional group who grow together through their meetings, but can also get better big picture understanding and know who to reach across the aisle to, to get shit done. Yep. Right. And mm -hmm. to your point, when you assemble a committee, it can accomplish the same thing. All right. I want to go through, because in your story, I, I want to let you run through it and not interrupt you with some of them, but boy, you hit on a lot of just nuggets of wisdom and also things I'm, I'm a little bit more curious about. So you mind if I rapid fire through a, a few of the things? Go right ahead. Early in your story, you talked about exposure to different functions, right? How you had the opportunity to move around, to do different things. And, and similarly, uh, at Sony Electronics, where I thought I might retire at one point, if to be in there for a long time. That was one of the things that grabbed me so much is it, it, I get bored easily. I'm attracted to shiny objects and I want to learn. So that flexibility or the opportunity for internal mobility was huge for me. You then talked about the newer, younger generation, more emphasis on balance, right? But 
not accepting this is how it's always been done, but why does it need to be that way, especially coming out of COVID? This, things are evolving, and it's frustrating. It's hard to keep up with, but I think it's for the better, right? But those two things, the exposure to different functions, younger generation and balance, and you talked about friends at work. I see those three things as three of the biggest factors in retention. No doubt about it. Retention is such an issue for so many companies. Trying to solve it by throwing money at it, creating more fancy positions and higher salaries and things. And so often it's not just the salary. Right? Yeah, a, big, a big proponent and a lot of people don't understand. If somebody has a really good friend at work, that's, that's a big thing that companies don't even think about. So you hit yeah. on, that's a great point. I love that in regards to what are the relationships with the other employees? That's why culture is so important and the things you do, you know, outside of business, getting them together and just really. How do you make space that. for that? Right. Yeah. That to your point with the committees like that, you could be creating an opportunity for camaraderie mm -hmm. for real friendship because like we care about what we do. We want to find satisfaction in the work, but it means so much more when there's that love for the people as well, right. That we work mm -hmm. with. Anything you've had, not only upward trajectory, some difficult things that you did, some hard decisions, uh, but through that, you've earned promotions numerous times. And then you've also gotten, it sounds like, quite savvy with mergers and acquisitions. So these are two separate things. But earlier in your career, when you were moving quite a bit up and uh geographically were there things that you did to best position yourself for visibility for recognition for promotion opportunities i didn't i i think one of the things that i in retrospect when i look i always just executed on what i needed to do and i've always been a believer when you execute you'll get noticed i didn't do any political or anything like that to position myself or anything else but the one thing that i did do a really good job of of made sure managing up I made sure that some of the things that um, I did or things that I were proud of did make it up and made sure one way or another. And it wasn't, it was intentional on my part, but it didn't come across as like, you know, hey, I want, I want to make sure this individual knows. Those are storms that a lot of the folks I work with deal with on a regular basis is if I see something, how do I manage up? How do I communicate it? Because people naturally fear speaking truth to power. It's mm -hmm. ingrained in many of us. Now others want to just defy it more naturally and get a thrill out of it. But generally getting somewhere in the middle of how do I communicate this up? Because it's for the betterment of the business, but I'm also afraid of repercussions. It, any thoughts there? Any experience in a, a strategic way? Or was it just very natural for you to do so? Or can you identify what made it successful? I think I'll say this, and not that I executed on some of the things, but I think it's funny. I work with a lot of emerging leaders. I work with advancing leaders when I get, and I work with a lot of business owners, CEOs, right? So the other day, I'll tell you a quick story. I had one of my uh, merging leaders and I'll do one-to-ones as well with them. And uh, we had breakfast and uh, we were talking about some stuff and I just posed a question. I said, okay, you're a young person in your organization. You want to move up. When was the last time, first of all, did you, have you asked in the organization, I like to have a mentor, you know, somebody within the organization that can take me under the wing because sure. that individual can. So I think that's one thing I would recommend to any young person in an organization, or it doesn't even have to be a young person, somebody that wants to aspire to move it up within the organization. Um, have a mentor, find a mentor, you know, things you learn or whatever, you know, meet with them on a regular basis. But the other thing is how many times do individuals, when they know they want to actually set up meetings with an owner, you know, hey, do you have time for lunch one day? I'd just like to sit down with you. It doesn't happen much. I had an owner come, so I sat down with this young individual for breakfast and said, Get a hold of the owner, and the owner was in my CE Vestige group, so okay. he, he's in my CE. But um, I said, call this individual and ask him to go to breakfast, or ask him for about a half an hour of his time, just to sit down and want to want to go over a few things. And uh, I gave him a template or an agenda of what really to talk about and things of that sort. But about a couple of weeks later, the the CEO of the organization, which is the owner, came to me and said. You know, out of the blue, I had one of the emerging leader, one of the people, one of my employees actually come to me and ask me for a meeting. And you know, I couldn't believe this is the first time it's happened. And I can't tell you how long. So what I would say is from a managing up standpoint, and I didn't do that. I, I used other avenues, but I would really encourage anybody lower to 
find a mentor within the organization that has a direct tie to either the owner or their boss, whoever is, you know, out there, sure. CEO, et cetera. So it does, cause they're going to, you know, Advocate. coming from somebody else. Yeah. yeah. And I was in my career. I mean, there's times where, you know, when I ran the East business, there was always recognition for things. And I'll never forget one year. I thought for sure I won this award and I did and somebody else did. And I had people coming up saying, you did a great job. I mean, they knew how hard I had worked. Yep. And I think I'm always, you know, I'm, I'm 57. This is the way I was raised. Go out, you put 110% anything you do. Um, I'm a big, that was one of the key things that, you know, we had a, an exercise in the Vistage, one of my meetings. And I said, you know, what was the best piece of advice you ever got from anybody that you utilized in your, in, in your life? And, uh, that was one of the best things that there was two things that really resonated with me. You know, I was taught, my thing was from my father and he taught me one day, I, um, he had a small business and he asked me to go up. I was 16, 17 years old. Uh, I had the shovel. We had about 12 inches of snow and there was a sidewalk around. We had an ice cream shop and, and I went up there and I did a half-assed job and I knew it and I had other things that were more important. All he had to do was walk in and say, look, I'm very disappointed in what you did. You, you didn't put, and you need to put 110, anything you're going to do, because people look at it, it's going to be a reflection of you and your family, et cetera. And yeah. That has resonated with me forever. So I am just a believer that if you put all the work in and you really organize and you get the right things and you focus on the right things, you will get recognized in an organization. That was me when I was going through my career. Now I really believe that to manage up, it should be more intentional. Try and get with an owner once in a while, but yeah. I would encourage everybody, you know what, whoever the owner or CEO or whatever the hierarchy is in your organization, just say, Hey, do you have time? And really sit down and think about some questions you'd ask them, not just how you do and things like that, but right. really alignment within organizations is so critical. We talk about it all the time. That's why EOS is so strong because it gains alignment within your sure. organization. Everybody's on the same page. You have the same rock school. Well, not the same they rock, know how their they work know. contributes to the larger vision, right? It's, and so many people too, from culture, if you have something that people can say, you know, if somebody asks you, you know, what does your organization do? You can say, well, we save lives or we do this, you know, something that's inspirational to them. That's really critical. But, yeah. but to go through and really ask some, some critical questions of the owner of look alignment wise, you know, how are you doing this or some strategic, what are some of your initiatives that, you know, I look at this and I'm, I'm seeing how I fit into this, but just come up with some really good questions and just. Ask the owner, ask the CEO to sit down for a little bit. That will be one that will stand out to that individual, I'm sure, for a long, long time. You encapsulate two of the things that I've seen personally, but also others do successfully uh, with that. It's so simple. It's so scary for some reason. No doubt. There's these yes. conversations. We talk all the time about how do you go about accelerating trust? Well, one of the things you can do, address it head on. Hey, I want to build better trust with you. Here's where we currently stand. How do you feel? We currently stand something where you just actually talk about it seems like you can't do that when you actually do it you're like oh it wasn't that bad and for the person that you're having that unconventional conversation with it's refreshing you're like whoa this person really cares they want it and i can see the same thing being true in that situation a senior leader would probably hope and expect that people are going to be hungry want to talk to them, want that visibility and exposure, yet it happens really infrequently. It made me think of the two that I talk about a lot. It's be intentional instead of hall room conversations. If you want somebody, if you want to be heard, mm -hmm. and if you want to learn by asking the right questions, make space for it. Don't expect it to happen when somebody's stepping out of an elevator and you're shooting from the hip. All right? If something matters, put on a calendar. To that point then, by doing that, you're also capitalizing on a high visibility opportunity. Like being able to sense when there's high visibility opportunities, for me, it was always change. Mm -hmm. There's a big change initiative, new ERP, new something that I knew was going to be a struggle. There are areas of concerns. I wanted to be the advocate, the champion, the one to say, let me show that this can be done. Because I knew that was so needed and I was usually the new guy I was like, ah, yes, level playing field. Now the institutional knowledge sure. doesn't matter as much, right? It can kind of elevate there. Yeah, I think just to elaborate a little bit, you know, one of the, you know, we talked about the mentor that I had that brought me to air gas. Uh, one of the things he really did a great job of that I'll allude to real quick is 
you know, when, when he was bringing me up through the ranks, uh, he would always say, all right, what's going on with this? And he, he'd ask me a question on how something was going or where I was focused on. And, and I would say, I'm doing this, 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 and this. And if I said black, he said white. He didn't do it all the time, but in certain cases. So one of the biggest things that I learned was really, if, if you're doing something, really believe in it wholeheartedly, mindset's everything. But your managers, if your managers ask you a question about something and you believe in it, just make sure you really believe in it and stand your ground. Because one of the biggest things that I, when I became a leader, I would check and just as a, as a, just a check in regards to, does this person really care about, et cetera, would, hey, I'm doing this. And I would say, well, I think you're better off doing it this way. And if they stood their ground and said, no, I disagree. I think this is why. I didn't care if I had a different opinion or not. That person really felt and that person is going to go back and really work to make sure it works out as opposed to somebody that says, yeah, you're probably right. I can do it that way. I guess what I'm saying is when you make a decision to do something, stand behind it and don't waver. Make yeah. sure you've done your due diligence. But I think a lot of the leaders out there and owners, they want individuals that know, hey, I am, I'm, I'm certain this will work, even though maybe it doesn't. We've all made mistakes, et cetera. We learn from them. But that was one of the things. Conviction. That, right? They have conviction. Made. Big, big, big. And that's one thing that I, I, I do see in, in supervisors, middle management sometimes is where, you know, even in some of the, the coaching sessions that I have, and I'll say, well, do this. And they'll say, yeah, I, I like that. I'll do that. And what I'm looking for them to say is, no, I really believe in this and, and back it up. Yeah. That's what you want to see. So I would say if you're not really convicted to something or you really aren't 100% on it, do more work on it before you present something. That's been a recurring theme through this conversation. I think the sentiment from your father about shoveling the driveway, it, it made me think of uh, Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. He says, don't half-ass two things, whole-ass one thing. Do things you believe in, right? If you're going to do something, put in the work, mm -hmm. show that you want it, that you're hungry, it gets recognized. It's, those are the sort of people I want to surround myself with, even if I disagree with them, mm -hmm. right? Even sure. if we're not sure. working on the same things at that time, if they care. You know, nothing's more frustrating than people who are just complacent or kind of mail it in the clock punchers, right? Sure. I know you have uh, a busy day as always, but I, I have one or two more quick ones for you, if you don't Certainly. mind. Not a, not a problem. Uh, first being, you hit on an acronym for herd that I'd never heard before, and you know what a group of buffaloes is called, right? Did you do that one by design? That just happened no. naturally. All right. Uh, no. What was herd again? So it's hours, emotions, uh -huh. relationships, and dollars. Love it. So I think whenever an organization, whenever you have an issue that you're trying to process, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you really break it down to those and ask questions regarding those top four things, it'll really fine tune what really will help you make a decision or what the important components of that decision should be. I'll take a picture of you and attribute you properly if I use <laughs> that one again. Is that all right? Uh, be fun. So I got it from somewhere else, but it's been passed on. And, mm. and I coach to that as well when we do issue process in some of my, my meetings as well. If we have a, a member of a leadership team or a leadership team who is, they've grown the business, they're considering succession. What's next for them? Maybe they're recognizing they've, what got it here won't get it there. They're hitting a ceiling. You've been through mergers and acquisitions quite a few of them, it sounds like, on, on both ends of it. I have. Uh, mm -hmm. Share what you can. Uh, I know, you know, maybe in a, we could talk about this the entire day, but in somewhat high-level format, but take me through some of the thought process, the wisdom that you have gained through that process, that if I am an entrepreneurial owner that is at this crossroads of what the hell do I do? Do I consider selling the company or are there other options? What, what would be your, hey, think of these things, or, or if there's any questions you would ask that person to help them think through, like what some options were for them? If I'm an owner looking at from a succession plan, I'm at a stage in my life where I'm trying to exit business. Exit or minimize involvement, maybe. I just know that I'm nearing a time where I'm stepping back. So on that, that point, and I deal with a lot of owners like that, and that's where, you know, um, this is what I would say. I've, I've acquired a lot of businesses over my career. You said I went through a couple acquisitions that I was a part of just and, um, and learned on the other side what went well and what didn't. But I would say the first thing, if I'm an owner 
I want to find a company to look at. If I'm looking to court somebody that is going to, you know, take over my business, I want to consider a few things. One is an ESOP. One is a business that has a very similar culture to mine. That's critical. The culture always, in any acquisition, the culture mix is absolutely critical. That is one thing that I've learned over a lot of different acquisitions is you need to have the culture fit. So, then I think we talked a little bit about the ESOP. So I would look at the ESOP for sure. ESOP being? Uh, ESOP being an employed shared ownership. shared ownership plan. I think that's becoming more and more prevalent. I'm not going to say it's everywhere, but I'm hearing more about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen some and I've got some friends that are very heavily in that. But I think from an ESOP standpoint, if you have a company that has pretty good structure, uh, there are tax benefits. Uh, I think from an employee retention standpoint as well, it can really be attractive to some owners. The There's some side, skin in the game too. So you could get elevated performance. No doubt about it. No doubt. I think the, you know, it is a, it's a, a plan that you have to, you know, wait for a while. It's going to invest in, you know, future, et cetera. But the way the trusts are set up and, you know, employees, it is a long-term type of thing, but you do have more say in the company. And yeah. you know, I have seen where they work really, really well. I've, uh, some of my groups, I've got maybe five or six of them. We get into a little bit, but just a contribution that, you know, when you can contribute 10 to 15% to a retirement, et cetera, it's a big advantage. No but, doubt. But nowadays, you know, you get more and more people that are like, I want that in my pocket now. I don't want to, you know, do that. So it's kind of like the, the 401k discussion of, you know, are you investing for your future, et cetera. But I think ESAP should be something that uh, an owner should look at. Mm -hmm. um, I think is there a good fit with another organization? I mean, private equity is always, you know, on the forefront as well. And when I go out, I'm, I'm very active in, in acquisitions right now. Um, my play is, you know, it's a smaller business. Our cultures fit together. We care about people. It's not going to be where we want the people to stay. So for me, it just depends upon the owner as well. I mean, some owners I find that, hey, my first thing is I want my people to be taken care of. You know, I've got family in the business, et cetera, whatever. Some, some owners, unfortunately, in my opinion, are like, I don't care about the employees. Just this is what I want. It's all about money. Yeah. So it's just, it's, it's hard to really define that. But I would say if I'm looking at really understand what I want out of it, you know, what's most important to me and find somebody that, um, that fits that, 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 um, those needs, whatever I'm more on that. I've spent so much time buying businesses and acquiring businesses. And there's so many things that come into play with structure. And I find a lot of businesses right now, I've got a lot of activity on it where the businesses that I'm looking at are, are smaller. So let's say 10 to $50 million. Um, the owners are at a point where, you know, they're baby boomers. They're in their sixties. They don't have a succession plan. There's no other family member coming yeah. in. So it's more, Hey, you can come with a smaller company. We understand there's a good culture fit. You know, we can structure it this way. Again, some of them we can structure over three years and there's still, you know, payments which afford a way that, you know, some companies can afford that to smart companies to bring them in and, and really grow that way. Uh, hopefully this is answering your question, but. You're hitting just, both sides of it. So yeah, I, I love knowing what's appealing to you on the acquisition side as well, uh, other than the obvious with financials and things, just some of the recurring themes or factors that you've seen present in the best. Most owners want to know that, all right, I've, I've grown, and this is what I've seen when I got in private equity. Owners get to a point where they don't know how to take the next steps a lot of times, or they're hitting a point where they're at an age where they don't want to do it anymore, but they want to have a really good, they want to continue what they've built. Yeah. They really care about it. So they want, what I would want is an organization that's going to add value in the way they're structured. Structure is so critical. So if I'm, a, if I'm an owner and I have a $20 million business and I've got a controller and I don't have a COO, but I've got people, more structure can mean, all right, now I've got a CFO that can help me do this. I've got a COO that can do this. More of a sales infrastructure, things of that sort. Product diversification. The things that I look at when I look at a business is I want a business that isn't really they don't do different things. They're, they're, they're kind of doing the same things in an area where you can get more product diversification, add to more wallet share within the companies that, that you deal with. I heard a, a statement the other day, a gentleman brought this, this um, equation up to me that I didn't, I wasn't aware of kind of, but said a 2% increase in customer retention leads to a 10% decrease in costs. Wow. 
So, and that kind of hit me and I had to think about that for a while, but it just goes to how important customer retention to make sure that you're dealing and focused on your current customers. But if you can add more wallet share, getting back to what my point is, when an owner sees a company that has other products and can see that, hey, I, I supply my products to this customer, but they use this other product, it's wallet share. I can just go in and start selling this additional product to this company. Sure. They already know me. You know, there's advantages there. So. I would say if I'm an owner, I want to I want to partner, or be acquired, or acquire a business that has some kind of structure or fits in a way culturally that it can take the next level and get back to the you know we talked about the flexibility and control. Some companies get to a point where they're kind of stagnant. You know, acquire a business that has something that hey can take you back in that go 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 get out there and have that that mentality. Hopefully, that yeah, answers that, the question. Yeah, that's helpful. I, I... When you have insight to it that, you know, m many others wouldn't, I'd love to pull that out. And I'm sure you're open to having, you know, conversations with those. If sure. uh, they'd like to talk to somebody who's been there before, uh, we'll make sure that your information's included at the end of this. That sidestep mentioned about 2% customer retention can equate to a 10% reduction in cost. Boy, the most expensive thing a business does is acquire a new customer, right? It's that and onboarding are, are generally, you know, your people cost, but sure. acquisition of a new customer. That brings this all together. If you create raving fans because you have a, a great culture, mm -hmm. great team, well, your team's going to create raving fans. They're going to bring in more employees that they're friends with. They're going to make, it's going to be a stickier environment that they're going to hang around in more. And you're going to have better cost uh, of, of goods, better profitability, right? It's funny how if you just focus on these critical few <laughs> things, your people, your structure, tools, or process, right? Uh, usually a lot of the other stuff that seems so complex just works itself out, right? I'd like to end with just any, of course, anything that you want to share, but we talked before this about how important it is to ask good questions. You mentioned some of the critical questions that you have, but more so with the folks that, the work that you're doing now, Kevin, like, do you find yourself do you have kind of a tool belt of these questions help people grow, right? Or, or are there things that you ask emerging leaders, advancing leaders from a coaching point of view? Do you have kind of a, a grab bag or, or any that come to mind uh, that are your favorite questions to ask people to really understand, to really help them in some way or, or to help them understand you in a question form just to better connect. I don't know what, what comes to mind. Uh, if you have a short list of thought provoking questions or just favorite questions, to ask. I'll put a little bit of spin on it here, Joe, for you. Sure. Um, when I get with somebody, I don't know because I, I want to really be in tune with where they're at. So I'll put it this way. My first question that when I sit down at a table is what is the most important thing we need to talk about today? Because every individual in my set has a different, it might be personal, it might be business, it might be something, but there's something that's on their mind, either they're losing sleep over, they're anxious about, there's something. So I'll phrase it that way. Maybe that doesn't answer your question, but I, I put it, it in a different does. I, I, I think as a leader, understanding where and what is the most critical. So what's really on your mind, it's the biggest weight that I can help with. It's the biggest thing that I can do to help an individual. Yeah, I like that a lot. Well, so there's a lot of different questions you can ask, you know, but I think that one in particular to really get in has been one that I use quite a bit and it's, it's served me pretty well with the people that I deal with. We have a finite amount of time. Yep. So getting to it, mm -hmm. finding out where you can help most instead of guessing. Yeah, yeah. I'd say that's a pretty damn good one. Yep. So, well, thanks. Kevin, anything else you want to take an opportunity to share? Uh, ways to get in touch with you? Any... Uh, Kevinisms or or other sentiments that that you you, you find hyper valuable that you say often or just uh, you know final words. First of all, you'll have my contact information. So um, I would say for the individuals out there, you know, in business, some of the there's been a lot we've talked about. Um, for me, be and do something you're very passionate. I'll, I'll go. I've got uh, seven kids, children, and I've got two stepdaughters that I love very much and. And I'm very proud of every one of them. I think the way I raise my kids, it, we talk about it all the time, do something you love to do because you're always going to be passionate about it. So if you're not passionate about something, find something you're very passionate about. But anything you do, 
put 110% into it, you know, but, but just treat people. You talk about the golden rule. Now it's a platinum rule. Understand what's important to other people, you know, the golden rule, treat others as yourself. There's different things, but you know, um, I think just overall, it's just in business. It's really understanding your critical few that you need to need to get done. Focus on that. Accelerate with that. Manage up. You know, really know where you want to go. And a lot of the people I deal with, you know, they say, "Well, I don't think I can get to this this position." Not have aspirations. Know where you want to go. Have a strategy for doing it and execute them. Yeah, appreciate you in a big way, Kevin. Uh, kindred spirits in a, a lot of ways. Of we've both found passion and gratification and helping others learn from our failures uh, and, you know, just a healthy, <laughs> healthy culture and leadership. And I, I have a tremendous amount of respect and appreciation for you. So thank you for coming on today, sharing some of that with our, with our listeners. Uh, and with that, you can find more information in the show notes, the description down below. Appreciate you as always for tuned into, into the storm leaders. And we'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Appreciate it, Joe. Thanks, Kevin.